So next up, we have Mark Merlin, who was very busy last year with the project for the Open Hardware Miniconf, did a lot of software development for that. So he's going to talk to us today about um, coding for ESP32. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. So who was here last year and has one of these? Yes, a couple, a few? Oh, a few more over there. There you go, yeah, I've seen yours, cool. So you might remember that, uh, yeah, the hardware was all ready. The software still had to be written. And there was definitely a lot of things to do. So that's what this uh, small talk is about. Um, if you're interested in all the links and so forth, I recommend you take a picture of this slide. The link at the bottom gives you everything else, uh, including all the links that you'll see during the talk. So that's an ESP32 board. You'll recognize the battery. Uh, it's an older version of the chip and a bunch of I.O. on it. Um, and I guess you'll get better pictures on the slides because it's kind of hard to show from here. All right. So you have all those lovely people, some of whom you may recognize. Uh, they all look nice and smiley. They gave you a little piece of hardware that looks uh, kind of sweet. So it's like, oh, OK, I'll sign up. How, how hard can it be, right? Uh, but anyway, let's go back in history first. Um, they've done a lot of these. Uh, the Pebble V1 was many years ago. I actually got one after the fact. Uh, that's how I learned to program some, do some Arduino code back in the days. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I can do my own stuff. I can make all the sensors work. Uh, and then we had this MOPS and that uh, board that was meant to go into a rocket, but I didn't have a rocket, so I made a sleep monitor out of it. Um, that also was a lot of uh, hours spent. Uh, the Pebble V2 was a new version of Pebble V1, had a uh, nice little LCD, so you could actually start writing. Uh, that's where I started getting in trouble by writing my own, uh, or porting um, uh, LCD driver for it and making use of all the LCD functions that were not available with the original code. ESP Plant was the first version of a ESP chip. Um, that was, I think, two years ago now. And then we had last year, which was this little guy. And kind of all it did was light up LEDs without actually giving you any control over them and showing a little pattern like that, which was nice. It showed that it booted, but that was about it. The rest was for you to write. Um, it was very nicely made board, actually. If you look in the back, uh, you can see all the I.O. ports are actually listed. So um, the only one issue with this board is, as sweet as it is, sadly, I think it was only the run that was made for LCA. I've had many people ask me, how can I buy one? And I don't think the answer is, you can't buy one, right? Nice. Yeah. So, or you can make your own, because it's, you know, the hardware is obviously published. Um, <clears throat> and like every LCA, you saw the previous talk, it's like, oh, we should do something. Oh, it's next week. Oh, it's tomorrow. Uh, so the board was done, and it worked actually quite well with a few details. Uh, the software was kind of, uh, well, there's a test code that shows that it works, and the rest is for you to do. Uh, ESP32 was a new chip at the time, so the libraries were also not really existent or not always working. So really, it was just uh, kind of cutting edge. And to make things easier, there were actually two different ways of programming it. One was the um, Arduino way with a layer that was not quite finished. The other way was a low level where you could talk to the chip directly um, using a kind of a different way of programming, which is more powerful, but uh, was just different from what I, I was used to. So to make my life easier and reuse some drivers that existed, I just went the Arduino way. It means I only got to use one of the two cores, but that was good enough for what I was doing. So uh, yeah, showing the previous projects, I got conned with some previous ones. So this one, I got conned even more uh, into writing code. Uh, here's a few links from the previous projects. Um, so I'm not going to go into details. You can just get them if you're interested. And because I didn't learn this as in last year, uh, I ended up really writing, uh, spending a lot of time writing code for this uh, just because I had that hardware and it didn't really do anything, but it could do so much. So. Uh, one of the things was the, the LCD, sorry, the, the screen that came with it uh, was quite powerful. The driver was not, uh, it was barely functional. It was extremely slow. Um, and you had to use, I think, software SPI because hardware SPI was even slower than software at the time. Uh, so you could display stuff, but it was not really good for anything else, especially, you know, this scrolling or anything in real time. So however, by the end of LCA, by not listening to enough talks and spending too much time on it, I was able to at least make the touchscreen working and then a display. 
It wasn't fast. Uh, you had to write very slowly to actually get those things aligned. But it, you know, it was a proof of concept. Then I was able to port uh, the Adafruit code that did similar things that wasn't meant for this board, but I, I got it working using their library and porting what was necessary. Um, that was using the accelerometer in the board, so you could just take the board, shake it, and it would make those circles. And then I was the end of LCA, so I ended up being in a plane uh, on the way to a ski resort, where after the lifts closed, I had nothing much to do. Uh, so that gave me a lot, a lot of time to actually start writing code, including uh, pretty much a low-level graphics library to go on top of the drivers and start writing your own menu system. You could actually click on that. They would like flash it, show you what you selected. Nothing really you know, fancy, but it takes a, uh, a while to write. Um, that way you could select which demo you want to run as opposed to reflashing it every time. Now, I wanted to reuse stuff that was already existing because a good programmer is a lazy programmer. So I figured, well, there's got to be some Tetris code out there for Arduino, and sure enough, there was. Uh, it wasn't actually meant to work on this, but at least the underlying code existed. Um, and sadly, it uses a different version of the uh, TFT library that was not quite compatible. So I had to kind of steal the primitives and port them uh, to the library that was existing for this chip. But eventually, success. So I got Tetris working, and I also got another a version of Breakout uh, working too. And they're actually quite fast once I got proper drivers uh, that were faster for talking to the screen. As I mentioned initially, it was really slow. Um, I also found some other code uh, from yet a third version of that uh, library, because there were actually three different versions that were all incompatible, that allow you to display bitmaps. So this is a bitmap that's actually being scrolled uh, by the uh, rotary encoder you can see in the corner. And then I even found some uh, demos. I don't know who's old enough to remember the 8-bit computers we had back in the days, people doing crazy things with them. Someone actually wrote some demos from those days uh, and ported them to um, that was the TNZ V3, I think. And again, same, different libraries, but I was able to take the underlying code and port it to that, uh, to that screen and the code that, the libraries that I did have. So lots of nice uh, little demos like these. Now, one thing that was really annoying with this board is it had those two LEDs on them, uh, which looked very nice, but making them work was actually kind of a pain in the rear. Um, because they were uh, NeoPixels, and there was no working NeoPixel library uh, for this chip. So uh, there, was, there was a library from Adafruit, which didn't work, because, again, it was a new chip. Um, so I was able to hack it enough to make it work, but it was using interrupts and timing, which don't quite work well on the ESP chip, because the ESP chip is always doing something in the background. So anytime you have a delay and then you hope that things are going to work out. They works most of the time, but not well enough. And there was another person who actually started using the RMT functionality that's in the chip, which is basically a DMA engine that lets you do I.O. separately from the CPU. So you program it, you say what you want, and it will send the right waves to control those LEDs. Uh, sadly, when I used it, the demo worked, and as soon as I put it into my code, it would randomly st stop working and I would change two lines of code, and then it would work, and it would not work again. And after a week plus of work, found out it was a code alignment issue. And depending on how the code was aligned, then the code would crash on out, which ended up being a bug in the underlying libraries that got fixed since then. So eventually, uh, I guess it's kind of hard to show for everyone, but I was able to control the LEDs. Uh, here I'm using a slider. Uh, sorry, it's kind of hard to present to everyone. Um, and really, it was a, I was lucky at the time that there was one other person working on this, and the person working on the Arduino uh, emulation library, uh, MiloDev on GitHub, was super helpful in taking my bug reports problems and actually writing stuff on the fly uh, when I reported problems or things that were missing. So it took a bit over a month, but uh, thanks to him, uh, made a lot of progress. Uh, rotary encoders, those lights, you know, those turning buttons, they're obviously not new technology, but they're really a pain in the rear to actually use because they require very specific timing. Uh, you can, all the demo code you see is like a loop. It says, oh, you're in that fast loop and you keep 
listening to it. And if you do anything else and it, something happens in the middle, you're missing a little blip and then the button goes in the wrong direction or you're missing a click. So the only real way to do it is to have hardware interrupts, which of course were a new thing on uh, the Arduino library for ESP32. So that was also something that got added. Eventually I was able to get code working to, I mean, it, it feels silly to spend so much time on getting a little button to know whether it's going left or right, but really it took <laughs> a long time. Um, so finally, that was the demo I was trying to show. You have a slider now, you can select on the screen the level of each color, and it actually colors one LED, and the other one is actually the reverse color from it. Uh, backlight, so one thing I'm, uh, that was in the slides is, uh, even though the SP chip has a lot of I.O., um, all those I.O. pins were actually being used. So there's an I.O. expander that's designed to give you more I.O. pins, and in this case, sadly, the backlight control of the LCD is behind that I.O. expander. Um, one thing I want to do is make the backlight more or less bright, and the way you do that is PWM, just turn it on and off very quickly. But the I.O. expander makes it that you have to program the I.O. expander and say, please turn off. Then you send another command to the I.O. expander and say, please turn back on. And that makes it a lot slower than actually talking to a pin directly on your uh, chip. So I'm able to do a little bit of dimming, which, of course, I can't demo directly. It gives me four levels of control by just flipping very quickly using interrupts. And beyond that, it just doesn't work so well because I don't have fast enough control due to the I.O. expander. Uh, hardware drivers. So um, first, I, I uh, improved the Adafruit uh, library to control NeoPixels. It's, again, not the best way to do it, but there's so much code that uses the NeoPixel library that having support for it was helpful. Um, infrared was also missing. Oh, I didn't bring my remote, but I, I can use an uh, infrared remote to control it. It will change the colors, turn off the screen, whatever. And again, that's something that is interrupt driven. So having the interrupts for infrared, uh, if you don't run fast enough or the right timing, it stops working. And that was a little bit tricky uh, on ESP32 because again, it's, while you're in interrupts, it's actually still doing things in the background. Uh, but I was able to make it work well enough and port that into the uh, canonical library that most people are using. Uh, so now I can actually read from the infrared port. The Adafruit uh, LCD library. Um, so Mino Dev did a lot of work to actually make it go faster um, on the SPI for that chip, which is a little bit different from a regular SPI on Arduino. Um, then I found some extra code of primitives that were missing in the Adafruit library and ported them. So now you can have the basic Adafruit library and display bitmaps. You can do scrolling, a bunch of things that were not available before. Uh, so gray encoding interrupts for, uh, that was the uh, rotary uh, button. I uh, already talked about that. Uh, the joystick, another thing. <laughs> so the joystick was actually, it's a very cheap piece of hardware. It's not really centered. Uh, so I had to write a higher level library to detect left from right, even though the center is not in the right place. That's useful for the games. Um, then the I2C expander, uh, or the library where you just say, hey, I want to turn this bit on and off, as opposed to going, doing all the work low level. Touchscreen input, uh, because you have several things sharing the same bus, you have to select what device you want to talk to. So talking to the LCD to actually say, hey, display something, you cannot do that while you're talking to the touchscreen. So you have to turn on the LCD, say, hey, display this. Then you turn the, that off. You turn the touchscreen on and say, hey, is there anything touching you? Uh, and you go back and forth. The touchscreen itself, it being another cheap piece of hardware, uh, you kind of want to know what the person is touching. And you want to map that with the screen. Uh, originally, I kind of hard-coded this. And I realized, well, of course, they're not all calibrated the same. So I don't know if anyone has an, remembers an old Zorus or an old device uh, like that, a Palm Pilot. You had to calibrate it by touching the pen and a few little dots on your screen. And I would tell it, hey, it would say, hey, this is the center. Touch it, and I'm going to see where the center is on the touch screen. So that's how I did it. And I wrote similar code for this. Um, in my case, it was even worse because I actually broke the touch screen while traveling. It smashed it. So it still worked, but the touch screen itself was completely broken. So I, brought a new, I bought a new one uh, from the internet, which, believe it or not, actually arrived broken, too. So that was very nice. I waited two weeks to get another broken one. I guess after getting a third one, that one actually worked. 
and I realized that the input was reversed. So when I touched one corner, another corner, it was opposite from the ones we got uh, with the original device. So the calibration code I wrote, this actually detects if it's a reverse screen or not. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit ahead of the slide. That's the, uh, yeah, the control. So you're basically touching those little lines, then it sees how far you go off the, t the side of the screen. It remembers the uh, coordinates for each, and it can see whether it's reversed or not, which it is doing in this case. Uh, right, so I did all of this. Now, as I mentioned, this board, no one else, no one has it except the few lucky people who were here last year. Um, it is actually a lot better than the reference board uh, from, uh, um, that you get uh, from the manufacturer, at least for what I was trying to do. Uh, but I was able to like, hack it a little bit. If you see the bottom, the top is, of course, the IO test. The bottom is the reference board. Uh, it does not have a touch screen, but I was able to add a rotary encoder and a joystick, and then modified enough that, oh, and I actually have also an IRR reader here. So I basically made a poor man's IOTUS out of that for people who don't have an IOTUS, so they can reuse my code and at least a benefit from some of the functionality. The only thing mainly missing being the touch screen. And to make things simple, it's not quite compatible with the ILI library, so... Uh, the uh, expressive developer working on this made a library that works on both kinds of hardware and just detects and works all by itself. So that's kind of helpful. Now, one thing I've been doing since I've, I started working on Arduino and going to LCA is I learned about uh, Andy's ICO library. Um, on Arduino, most code is going through a main loop. It does something, it goes down, it goes down, and then when it's done, it goes back to the top. But if you're trying to do four things at the same time, like reading uh, the rotary encoder, uh, controlling the LCD brightness, reading the joystick, reading the rotary, uh, sorry, I already said the encoder, reading the humidity sensor, the temperature, and then displaying that. If you're doing that sequentially, it's just a pain, especially because you don't want to be doing them at the same rate. So that's why ICO comes in. Uh, ICO lets you say, hey, I want to run this code at this uh, frequency, which you can see at the this next screen. So the LED handler runs uh, every 10 seconds, the rotary, um, there's an interrupt that actually does the low level work, but then I can read that input in the handler and do something with it. The infrared, I only need to run it every 10, 10 times a second and so forth. So while well, ICO is actually meant to be running from an interrupt, um, I originally did this, but I realized if my code is running within an interrupt, I cannot do a lot of things because with an interrupt, you're not allowed to do other interrupts or you're not allowed to do serial control. Uh, so I think I have it on the previous one. Yeah, so in the end, I'm just doing a pull and I'm running it instead of delay. Um, so I can run the loop quickly enough without actually bound, being bound by the, all the list of things you can't do within an interrupt. Uh, the new pixels, I mentioned that a little bit. Uh, it's really a pain. It was a pain in the rear. Um, so if you're interested, there's links. Uh, to make things even worse is if you're doing new pixels plus infrared, there are two things that are very sensitive to timing. And a lot of code you find on the internet assumes that you're doing just that. Uh, so that it's running the uh, Adafruit one, for instance. It just stops interrupts, and then it does stuff, and then turns interrupts back on. But if you're trying to read from the infrared port, which itself needs to be running all the time. When you're changing your LED, you can't read from the infrared, which is kind of annoying. So I spent a fair amount of time trying to make both work at the same time and removing those uh, issues. Uh, on the SP32, the answer is you cannot be using the Adafruit library because just turning off the interrupt is not acceptable if you're doing other things at the same time. So um, there's actually a lot more hardware still on this board. Um, the SD card, I actually by the time I was working on this, the driver for SD card didn't quite work. Now it does. I just never got around to it. Uh, the microphone and the audio, um, those require special drivers that I did not find at the time. It didn't really feel like writing because they were not obvious. Um, infrared, there's actually a transmitting infrared LED. Wouldn't be too hard to use. I just had no good use for it. Um, then I mentioned uh, those two games I had. Those two games use yet another version of the TFT library. I have a pretty horrible hack where I initialize it with the ILI from Adafruit, and then I switch over to that other library, 
uh, because it has so many custom code in it that it was just too much work to port it out, uh, to port it all. So the game is actually talking to its own library while the end is being done by a separate library. So it works, but once you run a game at, at the end, you have to reboot because it doesn't work back with the original library. But hey, good enough for what I was trying to do. And uh, let's see. Yeah, should you actually have one of those boards? Uh, those are the links of the different things you can uh, look at, the code, so you can actually run that code yourself, steal from it, and I have a little video showing a demo. Um, so the future, uh, I'll be honest that it wasn't all for the fame and glory. I think probably a couple of people uh, used <laughs> uh, my code. Um, so at the, at the end of the day, I was like, oh, okay, that was kind of fun, but you know, I'm not gonna spend my whole life. I already spent probably three months on it. Um, so yeah, that's, pretty, that's about as far as I got. And at that, at that point, I had, like everyone else, other things that uh, took my attention. Uh, as I said, yeah, it wasn't for the flame glory or, glory or money, but it sure was fun. <laughs> Uh, you have a picture of this, uh, a link to these slides if you need all the links at the bottom. And I can show you the quick uh, demo, which is just a video since I can't do. Let's see, let me use this link here. Let's see. Uh, I don't need the audio, it's fine. Okay, so that's showing the, uh, whoops. Come on, full screen. So that's showing how you initialize the screen. Then you get the menu system. So like for instance, the Adafruit code, a lot of those, uh, like that code wasn't meant to be interrupted by something else. I'm using the buttons yeah, that looks kind of shaky on the screen. Uh, I'm using the buttons to get out of the demo that I'm in. Um, and that's done using uh, background interrupts. Kind of hard to read the menu system even from here. But uh, one issue I had was the LEDs were very bright, so I have a way to make them dimmer or just turn them off. That's showing like uh, a bitmap display using the rotary encoder. There's actually a scroll function in the chip, so you don't have to scroll yourself. You just still like to scroll. It's and uh, that was, those were the very nice demos that I found, um, which thankfully I did not have to write, but I had to uh, port the underlying primitives that they were using. And once I got that working, all that nice demo code, uh, I got that for free. And the guy who did that demo code really put a lot of work into it. And I'm guessing you're gonna get a game probably. Yeah, the bottom is actually showing the temperature and humidity. Sadly, the analog read code on that chip doesn't work so well, so like the temperature is wrong by quite a bit and changes all the time. Um, but hey, well, at least it was a way to exercise the hardware. And that's using, yeah, the uh, rotary encoder on this one. Yeah, I, I kind of suck at Tetris, but anyway, you get the idea, especially when I'm filming with the other hand. And that's about it. I'll put back the slide if anyone cares about the link. Uh, full screen. Any questions? Let's see. Mark. Uh, yep. I'll put back the same, the last link here. Display. Present. This one down. No, okay, that's the last link. Yes, question. Sorry, it's multiple. Yes. So at the end of the day, ESP So, right. So, um, so basically, you're saying the ASP32 is a very it has a lot of features. It's a capable chip. Would I recommend using it? Um, I would say yes. I, when I got it, it was definitely green, <laughs> as in it was missing stuff. Uh, the chip was there, but the hard the software was missing, um, and it was a bit frustrating when I hit all those things and realizing that I was like driving on a road that was being paved, or crossing a bridge where the other side of the bridge wasn't finished yet. 
sometimes I had to stop the car so I wouldn't fall into a void. Uh, definitely, it got a lot better, right, in the last uh, nine months since I stopped working on this. The other thing, there were some bugs in that chip, as I mentioned, analog read was all over the map. Uh, the new version of that chip actually has uh, those bugs fixed, as far as I know. Um, a lot of people care about Bluetooth, I, 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 which I didn't use in this chip. Um, I understand that in the newer version, it's also working better. So it really depends on what you're trying to do, but all I can say is the amount of features you're getting on that chip for the price is really hard to beat. I mean, compared to uh, even a Teensy that costs more or the regular Arduino chip, I mean, this really blows it out of the water. Um, and now if you don't care about all the Arduino libraries and you're doing your own stuff and using the low level programming for it, then you get dual core and you get even more stuff. Um, so it's really up to what you're trying to do and how much effort you're willing to put into it. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you're just trying to light up a few NeoPixels, you don't need this. Like I have a NeoPixel ch shirt. I'm just using a regular older chip uh, because I didn't need this. But for the price, it's really hard to beat. So, you know, just make sure it does what you need and that the, the hardware support is, sorry, the driver su support is there. And if you, you know, if you have what you need there, I, I think it's a good choice. Maybe just one more question. Um, Who is next? Um, so you've done a fair bit of yak shaving in this exercise. Yes. Um, what's the one most important thing you would learn that you should, you think you should share with the rest of us? Outside of don't trust these guys and don't come to the other mini-conf. <laughs> uh, uh, most important thing. I mean, things I learned... It was interesting to learn low-level stuff when I had to port drivers. Usually, you know, on Arduino, you don't write your own drivers anymore. You just take this library that lights up stuff, and then you're done. You just call it. Uh, I had to go back to low-level C++, um, you know, port libraries. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting exercise. Uh, and it reminds you to the, of the days where you had to do everything yourself, even including, like, making a little grid and then when you click on it, it like flips the display to show you you actually clicked on it. Uh, stuff like that. It's not rocket science, but it's the stuff you don't do anymore nowadays, right? Because there's a library, a toolkit, there's everything. So it, it was, it's not that I, I wouldn't say I'm wiser from having done all of this. It's more like, hey, this is all the stuff that I get for free and I never have to worry about. And it was interesting to do at least once. And then I think you appreciate the fact that you get all this for free nowadays and you don't have to write it like you used to 20 years ago. And I think there was one more question there or are we out of time? Yeah. Do you want to ask please? one more? Yeah. Who was there? Sorry. Do you still have a question? Question? No? No? All good? All right. Thank you. Everybody, thanks much.